Welcome to Put Back on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley, SNY's NBA insider. Our show is on all of SNY's digital platforms, and we've got two great guests today. Brendan Brown, been in the game for nearly three decades in around the NBA, college basketball, as a coach, scout, and an analyst. And our friend Sean Geddes, all you know Sean already. I hate Sean on Twitter. We love his insights. We love talking Knicks with him. So he's back here with us. And we're going to take your questions in the comments section. So keep those coming. But for right now, we're starting with the baseline. And that, Brendan, is Julius Randle, whose shooting struggles have really continued through most of these five games to start the season. Uh, he struggled again last night. Uh, really didn't do much offensively. And as opposed to the first game in Cleveland where he, I thought, moved the ball pretty well, rebounded, um, created shots for his teammates. You didn't see that that much Wednesday night against the Cavs. What are you seeing from Randall right now? Well, I, I see a lot of things that happened in the game last night that were strange. You're thinking the Knicks coming off a real solid victory in Cleveland, and then you turn it around to home. You think you're going to clean up the home and home. There are a lot of guys who are off in the game, but Randall, pretty much from start to finish, it's about his decision making, and you have to start looking at that from the very top of the game. And I think what the Knicks are trying to do to get him some shots, to give him some play calls, they're isoing him at the elbow, they're isoing him off the lane, and he's kind of over on the court all by himself. The, the further that he goes to the lane and the more that he plays with his back to the basket, that's where he gets in a lot of trouble. And a hard help, a quick double team, a late double team, those are the things that he struggles with the most. And he has, even in his good seasons with the Knicks. When you come and get him late, then where is the pass out? And then last night, there were times where he's trying to take on double teams and shoot anyway. Uh, the decisions and some of the effort plays in last night's game, I think, were very concerning. John, from the Knicks wall, what is your perspective? What do you think? Is it too early to be concerned about Randall? Where are you? Um, it's not too early to be concerned about Randall at all, honestly. I, I've come into every season almost, it feels like, trying to give Julius Randall a clean slate. And, you know, shooting 28% from the field is one thing. Uh, you know, struggles happen, you know, you, you can turn that around, but it's just the energy. He just doesn't look like he wants to be out there. He's, he's like not even late, but just completely not making defensive rotations. Uh, he let Max Struess look like Russell Westbrook driving by him on the fast break last night. Uh, he's not closing out. He's not boxing out and uh, hitting the boards like he should. Like he's average. He was grabbing like 12, 10 rebounds a night. Last night, he's barely on the boards. And it's just like, if you're not going to shoot well, do the other things like play with effort, play with intensity, uh, set screens. Well, he set a screen for quick last night and didn't roll or pop and kind of quick ended up taking like a 30 footer. But I just he looks like he doesn't care. And as a fan, personally, it hurts to see that it, it's tough to I feel like I would run through a wall for anyone in orange and blue. And it doesn't seem like Julius Randle would run through a wall for anyone in orange and blue, honestly. Yeah, I mean, just talking to him, knowing him being around him for the last few years, his care factor is there, but there's no denying what you see on tape sometimes where the possessions, it seems like he just takes some of them off. Our guy, uh, IQ for three on Twitter, he put together a thread of some of Randall's plays. I thought, you know, some of those plays, it was more of a team thing than a Randall thing, so to single him out on some of those, I thought was a little bit unfair because Brendan, uh, notes like not he wasn't the only one who was kind of loafing at times last night uh but you, you have to believe what your eyes are telling you uh and brendan when you see randall did you see uh him at, you know less than 100 percent, 50 percent on some of those defensive possessions what did you see let's talk about the context of the game you haven't played a great first half and you're still up by one can you do what you did in cleveland in the third quarter and, you know, you're at home, you should be able to do that as a five-man unit, get a surge and put Cleveland away when only Mitchell scored in the first half. What happened, and then Randall would be the epicenter of some of that, is he had a streak, uh, like mentioned before, uh, you know, he lets a layup go right by him on the break when the game is very tight. Uh, he goes for a loose ball, doesn't really get it, doesn't really run after it on the offensive end of the floor. 
had an offensive rebound in his hand, and a Cleveland guy just comes by and swipes it away. And a lot of these plays happened in a relatively short period of time where you're expecting the Knicks to surge, you know, whether it's with the first group or the bench group or et cetera. And it, it was just like when he gets bad, and it happened two years ago when the Knicks didn't make the playoffs under Tom Thibodeau, when he gets distracted, that's the right word. Is it a fan? Is it a referee? Is it one of his teammates? Is it a guy on the other team where he just kind of starts floating around mentally? This is where you have a situation now where there is no topping and there is no other power forward. So you're worried about Randall. Oh, if he gets hurt, they don't have a balanced roster. Well, in the third quarter of the game last night, you want to pull him, really, and you don't have an appropriate power forward to put in there. You say, well, go small. There are good parts to that and bad parts to that. But you don't have like a governor on Randall right now because you don't have a true power forward behind him. It's, it's interesting referencing the roster, and we're going to get into the R.J. Barrett injury next because maybe if R.J. was healthy, you might have thrown him at the four. Uh, but he wasn't available against Cleveland last night because of the knee. Before we get to R.J., though, we are excited to announce that the putback is now going to be available in podcast form. So be sure to download on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your <laughs> podcast. We will be in podcast form now. So if you miss us, uh, digitally on the screen. Definitely check us out for your podcast. But now, R.J. Barrett, the knee injury. Uh, we all saw him get undercut on a, on a dunk attempt, attempt at the rim by Derek White in the opener. Uh, after that play, I mean, he was wearing a brace on the bench after that play and he took it off uh, to come back in the game. And then he played, right? He played the next few games. But then he was out late uh, on Tuesday in Cleveland and then could not go uh, Wednesday. And that's troubling because anytime you have a player – uh, of the importance level of R.J. Barrett. And he's very important to this team, and he's dealing with a knee. You want to make sure he's right. But also, you know, it's early in the season, but you still have to win games if you're the Knicks. So uh, I don't know the degree of the knee issue for R.J. Barrett, but if he was out late in that Cleveland game in Cleveland and he was out last night, it, it's clearly not good. So uh, they want to get him back on the floor as soon as possible. You, you have to be cautious, though, because of the long-term uh, you need R.J. Barrett over these 82 games. We'll see what his status is for Friday in Milwaukee. Uh, but also, right now, I want to get into uh, just a general overview with you guys. Five games in, so early, 82-game season. Uh, Sean, what do you make of this group after these first five games? Uh, what do I make after the group after, after the first five games? I'm going to come out and say – that R.J. Barrett has been our best and most consistent player, and we're only five games in. So, of course, um, I know that Jalen Brunson is going to pick it up offensively. We need him to shoot better. Uh, he had, an, you know, an amazing shooting night in Atlanta. And other than that, he's kind of struggled from the field. Uh, I think that Mitchell Robinson has been just a dominant force, and we're getting 48 minutes of close to elite level center play between him and Isaiah Hardenstein. I'm very thankful for that. Um, I loved seeing Dante DiVincenzo and Josh Hart both play well at the same time yesterday. I think our bench is very solid and can be one of the best in the league, especially with Emmanuel quickly at the helm. I think he needs to be the first person off the bench. I, I don't like that he's not necessarily. Um, and, you know, Julius Randle has to pick it up. I, I just think that this this team has everything in place. You know, we've played well. Uh, and I think we played well in every game but the Pelicans game and, you know, last night necessarily. Um, but this team is a good team and can win basketball games, but we have to play to the best of our ability. And so on a night like last night when R.J. Barrett is out, that's still a game we should have won because Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle should have shown up. And so we've had too many nights now where both Jalen and Julius struggled, and we can't, we can't continue to do that. Once we get it right and we start playing the way we are capable of playing basketball, I think we should get right on track. Brendan, how about you? Five games, what's your big picture view with the club? Well, it was a very difficult five games. Every game, every team that you played is a quality team when you put it on paper. And so you just played five games in eight days with two back-to-backs in there in four different cities. So that's a very difficult start to the season. I think there have been times in these last two Cleveland games where there are little periods of time, the second quarter at Cleveland, some of the time in the game last night, where guys are passing up open shots. And are they there 100%? 
with their legs playing five games in eight days against quality people? I'm not sure. One thing that I do know is this, and I think it's positive for the team. And they have a tough five-game block coming up, but the rebound is, rebounding is at the very top of the league, okay? Offensive rebounding, defensive rebounding, total rebounding. Uh, Mitchell Robinson's number one in the league, again, at offensive rebounding. Hartenstein, like Sean said, is, is playing at a very high level, both offensively and defensively. The defensive numbers are also very good if you go and you break a lot of those down. So you're rebounding the ball, you're defending. Now the offense has to come along. Well, last year, the three main guys in the starting lineup, plus plus quickly, they averaged 84 points a game. Right now in this first five-game block, it's early, you're only getting 71. So, okay, who's doing their job and who's not? Well, Barrett is fantastic with his shooting splits and the 21 points per game. Quickly is doing what he's supposed to be doing in his minutes, and he's shooting well. So it does come back to Randall, and it does come back to Brunson, who are making an unusually low amount of two-point shots. And, you know, the Knicks, as a team, are 30th in two-point shooting. And you know that's going to get better because Brunson takes a lot of good shots, and that will make a, a big difference in trying to beat good teams. I have to think, too, that Julius Randle starts to hit shots. So maybe it's maybe um, I'm too close to the situation and I'm around him too often and I'm, I'm being too optimistic. But I have to think based on the body work, he starts to knock shots down uh, over the course of this season. But you know what? Josh Hart, I thought, said uh, something interesting in Cleveland. He did. Uh, he was interviewed by, I guess, local media and, and traveling reporters. And he said that Donovan Mitchell Nick's speculation is never going to go away. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with him. I think that. Uh, I know some fans are tired of the star talk, but it's not just media driven, right? I mean, Nick Governor Jim Dolan was on the record saying that he, he brings a guy like Leon Rose here to attract top players. Uh, you know, top people with the Knicks even you know, talk to friends in private about how they know they need to bring a star in at some point. So this is not a media fabrication. It's, it's there. They went hard after Donovan Mitchell uh, a couple summers ago. Now, has that ship sailed? I don't think so, because Mitchell was very, very clear with his words about signing an extension in Cleveland. He said he wanted to see how things played out with the Cavs. Uh, so that leaves the door open there for, for a potential trade if he wanted to force his way out. Obviously, Joel Embiid, I'm sure that he is at the top of the Knicks wish list if he were to become available. But just checking in with Philly people recently, they uh, the report from my buddy Keith Pompey about the Knicks being uh, willing to trade a few firsts and uh, some of the rotation players for Joel, uh, that was laughed at. The package was laughed at by Philadelphia. And as of last week, they were still uh, of the strong belief that Embiid wanted to be there, was committed to being there and winning there. So if you're waiting for Joel Embiid and you're the Knicks, that is a risky, risky proposition. Uh, but I think at some point you're going to see them take this big swing that we've been talking about for a while. And Sean, what I'm interested to know from you is who would be your guy? If you're Leon Rose, you're looking at the landscape, you've got what you have, draft picks, players, who's your guy? Uh, you know, it's honestly a tough question for me to answer just because I don't really live there anymore. Um, I've, I've really tried to be more focused on who we have here and the development of the guys we have. If I was looking across the league, I mean, you know, Zion just locked his his deal in. Um, you know, you got to look at Embiid, of course, but at the same time, that's a very large contract. The guy who's over 30, a guy who's injury prone, a guy who hasn't been to the conference finals. Like, I, you know, I, I was watching a game on TNT the other night, and they were like, oh, the Knicks need to go get a starting to go get Carl Towns to push them over the edge. And it's just like everybody makes these suggestions about getting guys to push us over the hump with guys who have never been over the hump. And so I'm not really too concerned about what's going on around the league. I think Jalen Brunson is a star. I think R.J. Barrett is becoming a star. I think that Emmanuel quickly has potential. You know, I think Mitchell Robinson is very good at his job. And so I, 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 I can't really, like, put myself in those, that frame of mind. But Joel Embiid is definitely a good option, especially with James Harden getting traded now. I don't care what Daryl Morey says. He's not trying to stay there long term. It, it's past long term. He's 30. So, you know, it's time. Yeah, but you know what? Is Daryl Morey going to move Embiid? He's not going to move Embiid willingly, that's for sure, because he didn't even want to trade James Harden. But is he going to move him to New York? You know, it's not like Joel Embiid 
uh, is entering free agency and he can force his way to a certain situation. He's got several years left on his deal. So as we saw with Lillard, Damian Lillard, it's not easy to choose your destination in that situation. And I can tell you uh, with 100% certainty that there will be um, other teams uh, pursuing Joel Embiid aggressively, uh, teams of the Eastern Conference, if he becomes available. But Brendan, I want to ask you, but Sean, I respect you because you're like a, a top pro athlete. You just want to focus on what's in front of you. You're not going to let the distractions get in the way. I like it. I like it. Not great for us, but I do respect it. Brendan, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just messing around. Brendan, Donovan Mitchell, Jalen Brunson, hypothetical. Uh, I guess you would say R.J. Barrett goes to Cleveland and, and let's say uh, Mitchell Robinson, just to throw things out there. How do you see that duo as a backcourt? Well, Jalen Brunson, I'd... Donovan Mitchell. Adding on to what Sean said, I, I think if you're a Knicks fan right now, it, the ability to get an A player during this season, I'm not 100% sure you can do that. But if you are thinking that way and you do want to subscribe to that, how many guys in the rotation are going to be playing at their best where they become trade options for you? So right now, Barrett and Quickly, you know, you might not want to give them up, but A players don't go on trees. You're going to have to give something up to get an A player. So the two of them being off to a good start, the two centers being off to a good start, that's really important as whether it's in the middle of the year or at the end of the year. Hey, look, after the All-Star break last year, seven of the nine Nick rotation players were playing unreal. So that should have maybe came into something via a trade to get an A guy. Now, what if you got Mitchell and you had Mitchell and Brunson and you say, well, they'll never be able to guard people. They'll never be able to do it that way in the backcourt and be that small. I'm not 100% in the regular season against having those two in the backcourt. I think what it comes down to is Brunson was terrific in the playoffs last year, just got better and better as it moved along. What is Mitchell in the playoffs? And if you go and you examine him outside of the bubble year, and the bubble year we don't know if it was good or bad or what it was, but outside of that, his playoff performance – hasn't been great. And we know that he's a, a major talent. He's the number one scorer who can score in a lot of different ways. We saw that the last two nights. I'm not averse to going that way, but I'm not sure that's the move that gets you to where you really, really want to go. Yeah, I thought uh, what Bob Myers on ESPN said was interesting. I think Stephen A. Smith brought up Carl Towns, and he said the move that you make here, it has to be, to get you to that championship level or to compete for, you know, conference finals. It can't be, you know, a, a move that's that's like kind of a sideways move. And he thought Carl Towns was more of a sideways move. So, you know, it's just interesting to hear from a guy of Myers' stature uh, where he sees the team. But let's talk about, for Sean's sake, let's talk about the stars that are here on this team right now. Jalen Brunson, Sean, how, you know, like as coming into the season, he was so good last year. What were your expectations for him coming into the year? What did you think he could do? Uh, I was telling people all summer, and honestly, you know, it's a slow start now, but I was saying he could be top five in MVP voting. I think that Jalen Brunson can put up about 28, 5, and 6 on, you know, close to 50, 40, 90 efficiency once he gets going. He needs to get going, like, right now. But I believe he's capable of that. I believe he's capable of scoring at that level. Uh, in 2023, in, in the second half of the season, a 41-game sample, he averaged over 28 points a game, and he did it very efficiently. In the playoffs, he averaged 30 points a game in the Miami series, uh, and I think that you know he's going to – I expected him and still expect him to increase his volume from three just as I did the season before, and I think the Atlanta game was like a glimpse into that. And so I just – and, of course, he's not going to hit eight threes a night, but I want to see him take and make more three-pointers to open the floor for himself and his teammates. I want to hear Brendan on uh, on Jalen, but I forgot to mention this about Donovan Mitchell. Uh, for the Mets fans out there, I asked him after his press conference last night, what do you think about the Mets managerial situation? He said he thought it was going to be Craig Council, but now he didn't think that was the case now. And if it was up to him, he would go after Carlos Beltran. So Mets fans, you know where Donovan Mitchell stands on the managerial search. Uh, we'll see if he ends up standing in New York in a couple of years. I don't know. I, I, I see that as a long shot right now. But Brendan, in the here and now, Jalen Brunson, you talked about the two-point shots, the two-point percentage uh, overall with this team. For him, what are you seeing from him on the shot, and, and 
what's different in these first five games from last year? Well, I think there's a reality now that when teams are going to play the Knicks and they've played quality opponents so far this season, there's going to be a little bit more game planning. There's going to be a little bit more, we're taking the Knicks a lot more seriously, being that they won a playoff series last year and, you know, play deep into the series with Miami. So that's going to go to Brunson right away. And a lot of teams are just playing him with a bigger defender, uh, someone that's a small forward type of a guy, and they're staying at home on everybody else. So they're almost daring Brunson, go one-on-one or we'll send, you know, late help to you. And that's hurting in a couple of different ways where he doesn't get opportunities around the lane that he might usually get or he's just missing. My big thing with Jalen Brunson, and it goes back to the Miami series and it goes back to Miami game six, you know, okay, no one else had it going. Well, did you develop in the first and the second quarter of the game like Michael Jordan did, like LeBron James does, where you get a lot of people involved early in the game so that you can kind of take over late in the game. But when you need to throw it to somebody in a fourth quarter, in a clutch game, are you ready to get an assist when it counts? Last year in clutch games, Brunson took 31 field goals, uh, made 31 field goals, and only had four assists. In the playoffs, he made seven field goals and didn't have an assist in a clutch game in the playoffs last year. So, yes, we know you can make the fadeaways and the bounce backs, and you're really good at pivoting and getting yourself to the lane. But is there a fine balance where you get, like, one really big assist that can help you win a close game. That's an interesting point. Interesting point, Brendan. I want to also go to RJ Barrett because obviously he's hurt now, but uh, Sean mentioned earlier, I thought he played pretty well uh, thus far this season. Uh, I know your team, RJ, Sean, are you proud of your guy right now? I'm, I'm extremely and immensely proud of RJ Barrett. And honestly, I think that, and I said it the other day, the only person who can guard RJ Barrett is Tom Thibodeau. I think that he's not getting the ball as much as he should. I think we're not putting him in position. We're trying to run so many pinch post isos for Julius, and we keep having RJ come take the dribble handoff. He can't even turn the corner because Julius is on the wing right there, so he's got to dump it to him no matter how well. Like, Julius is shooting 28% from the field right now in the season, and that's no knock on Julius, but it's just like we're clearing it out for the guy who's not playing well so the guy who's playing the best on the team can go stand in the corner and hope that he gets the kick out. I just don't think it's the most efficient way to use RJ. I don't think that his minutes distribution has been as great, but he has been dealing with a knee injury and we're five, four games in as far as RJ playing. So I can only speak so much to that, but I think that he needs to be treated like he's playing the best basketball on the team so far because he is. And so when we lean into that, I think it'll be even better for him. But yes, I'm so proud. And I'm even not only just for the offense. One thing for me, I'm really big on RJ with. I think he's so capable as a defender. And I think this season he's shown that capability and he's given that effort. He's taking the matchup seriously and he's playing defensive pride again. I'd love to see that. So RJ being a two-way player and scoring the way he's capable of scoring, taking the mid-range jumpers, shooting over 80% from the free throw line, knocking down the three. I think the sky's the limit for RJ Barrett, as I always have. I feel like we've gone uh, negative a lot throughout the show. Knicks are coming off of a bad loss. But I want to go positive for a second. Mitchell Robinson, um, he's been fantastic. He has been, uh, I mean, foul trouble in the opener. Uh, Tom Thibodeau even said that fourth foul that he picked up against Boston, if you remember it, uh, he was out of position because of the rotation, a rotation mistake. He shouldn't have been put out there. So he was out on an island. So by and large, the fouls have been great for Mitchell Robinson and just the way he's impacting the game. uh, It's been fantastic. And Brendan, you watched Mitchell uh, from his rookie year to now. What do you see from him over the first five games and just kind of his ascension over the years? I think something that was interesting that happened in the game at Cleveland is that Mobley was lined up at center and Mitchell was defending him. And Mitchell, for the most part, was throwing him around the lane. Wherever that Mobley wanted to go, cut, try to receive the ball, catch the ball, try to get a shot off around the basket, to think of back to his rookie year of what he was then and jumping at all times. And then there, there was the foul trouble early on his, in his career for him to be like a solid physical guy, uh, depend defending around the paint. And this was very much an individual one-on-one matchup with Mobley. And then Hardenstein came in and he did the exact same thing. 
Like the Knicks like own Mobley, like at that position, those two guys defending him. Uh, Mobley, I think, might be going backwards in his development. But like a night like last night where Robinson gets as many offensive rebounds as he did when the Knicks needed him because they weren't shooting well in the game, you can never underestimate that he's the leading offensive rebounder in the NBA. So Knicks fans get upset. They say, well, he should have a post move or he should make a jump shot. Playing for Tom Thibodeau, that's not his job. And he's not going to get a lot of shot opportunities nor is Grimes playing with the other three guys in the starting lineup. So he just does his job. His job is to roll to the basket, try to get lobs and dunk them, uh, try to get offensive rebounds. Uh, Clyde said at one point last night, you know, it'd be nice once in a while if he'd turn around and just try to score. But does he have a fear factor of getting fouled and then having to go to the foul line where right now he's only at 50%? So his energy... Uh, The Knicks right now are not getting a lot of blocks. They're down in the bottom of the league in blocks, and blocks are a great way to run. And when you're missing R.J. Barrett last night and he's your best transition guy, then the offensive rebounds that Robinson got last night became even more important in the game. I think the Knicks ended up taking 18 more shots than Cleveland last night. Obviously, bulk of that is because of Robinson and the offensive rebounding. Uh, the score would have been much worse. The game would have could have been much uglier if he wasn't getting those offensive boards. Uh, right now, guys, we're going to go to Matt Spenley, uh, our digital guru, who has got a fan question for us. What's up, Matt? Fellas, how we doing? Uh, I have a question from DM Baez on YouTube who is asking, why isn't anyone talking about the disappointment that Quentin Grimes has been? Grimes got off to a uh, rough start in yesterday's game. Uh, Sean, I want to go to you for this one because I know the wing rotation, DiVincenzo, Devo, as uh, as Clyde calls him, have has played really well. Hart struggled a little bit, but with Grimes and the rest of the wing rotation, how have you felt about that through five games? Uh, it's been kind of disappointing. It has, uh, and like like Brendan said earlier, you know, guys aren't shooting the ball, and Quentin Grimes especially. And I think that Quentin Grimes is very talented. I, you know, I, I heard about him having possibly more of a role in the offense. I know that he probably wants more of a role in the offense, but you know, I said yesterday in the post game show, you're not going to be given more if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing with what you have. And so your role in the offense right now is to shoot the ball, and he just looks timid out there. And then even when he like in the past two games now, uh, in the game of, uh, at Cleveland, he had a shot in the corner where Donovan Mitchell fell down, and then he rushed the shot. And last night he had another shot where his defender was out of place. He was wide open. He rushed the shot and he airballed it. And it's like, as the resident sniper on this team, those are shots you have to hit. And I know that shots aren't always going to go in. You know, if you shoot 40% from three, you're an amazing shooter. So every shot's not going to go in. But, you know, he needs to – he doesn't look like he's shooting with confidence. Like, I want him to let it fly. He had a shot last night in the second half in the left corner where he got a kick to him in the corner – Donovan Mitchell was closing out, but with Quentin Grimes' shooting for him and his release and the way his release is high, if he let it go right away, there he would have been there would have been, you know, like Donovan Mitchell wouldn't have impeded his jumper. And so he waited till Donovan got there, then he pumped faked, and then he shot a contested three and he missed it. And it's just like, no, bro, take the first shot. And I think that's coming down like with DiVincenzo, you know, that's an issue with Josh Hart. Normally he's seeming a little better with it. But I think guys have to shoot the ball, honestly. Like, we, we've got to put shots up. you got Mitchell Robinson down there, Isaiah Hartenstein. We've got the best offensive rebound in the league. Please shoot the ball. Yeah, they were hovering around 18% from beyond the arc the entire game. And I thought last night that they did pass up some looks, particularly second half. It seemed like there was a tentativeness from, from many of those guys that you mentioned, Sean. And, and Emmanuel quickly, I think, pump faked one where he had a good look. Uh, and seemed to kind of pass it up for a pump fake and a tougher look. But anyway, um, we, we want to talk about uh, Dante DiVincenzo and Josh Hart uh, because, as Matt mentioned, they're a big part of that wing rotation. DiVincenzo uh, being the new addition, being the Knicks' biggest offseason move. Brendan, Dante through five games and Josh through five games. What are you seeing from those two, the Villanova guys? So let's break down the Knicks team. So you have the three main guys, and quickly last year they get 84. Well, right now they're only getting 71, and you would assume that that would go up with Randall and Brunson shooting better. The two centers are only going to get four or five shots a game. That's why it works in a Tom Thibodeau offense. So I call these other three guys GHD. I know we had the kid line with the Rangers, and there have been other great lines, but add up every night right now 
Quentin Grimes, Hart, and DiVincenzo. Because they're going to be very, very important when you have the four main guys. Let's say two of them have an off game and they don't shoot well. So how are you going to get enough points if you're the Knicks right now? The offensive stats aren't great right now. How well, just add up those three guys every night. Grimes, Hart, and DiVincenzo. Last night, DiVincenzo had a very good first half. Because of the way the game was flowing, his points were very important last night in that first half so that you had a one-point lead at halftime. You know, and you, you always just want to be in an ability to win at halftime, whether you're playing at home, but definitely on the road, and the Knicks are 2-1 and one on the road. So what are Grimes, Hart, and DiVincenzo going to do? And I think when you're guarding the Knicks and you're preparing for the Knicks, you're preparing for the main three guys and then quickly comes in and you got to pay a lot of attention to him. So who's open? Grimes, Hart, and DiVincenzo. GHD, they got to do it. They have to shoot well from three. Uh, when they get their opportunities in transition, Grimes more of a three-point shooter. Uh, Hart likes to go to the basket. DiVincenzo does a little bit of both. These three guys, there's a lot of pressure on them to be, let's just say, solid offensive players, guys that are going to shoot around 50% or guys who are going to convert in transition when you get a steal. The Knicks are getting a ton of steals right now, and they'd never usually do that. So these three guys have to do it. Add them up every night. Grimes, Hart, DiVincenzo. Are they shooting 50, 40, 30%? What are they doing? There you go. GHD, the formula for Knicks success. So certainly keep an eye on that. And uh, we're going to go ahead to Friday. Knicks Bucks, first in-season tournament game uh, pool play uh, for the league. It's going to be on ESPN. And uh, obviously Knicks first look at Damian Lillard, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, what do you think, Brendan, about the matchup and, and how the Knicks could potentially steal one in Milwaukee? Uh, Bucks are a little funky right now. And that is definitely going to happen when you played offensively one way and defensively one way under Budenholzer. And now you have Adrian Griffin in there and everything is new and everything is different. I happened to watch the first quarter of that game last night at Toronto because it was a seven o'clock game before the Knicks and the Nets. And uh, they just didn't look like they were into playing in the game whatsoever. And, and on both sides of the ball. It wasn't like anyone was running the spots and getting where they were going to have to be to start the offense. Do I think that's going to happen on Friday night? No, they're going to be at home and they're going to play a lot better. But they've had two games that I've watched, you know, against the Hawks at home where they got dusted and then where they really weren't 100% sold in the game, you know, last night against Toronto for whatever reason. And I think there's a lot of newness to what they're doing. I think Lillard is still trying to find from what I've watched, when do I get my shots and where do I get my shots from here? Uh, Giannis being off the ball a lot more than he has been the last couple of years, he's looking to shoot on every catch. So it's a different sort of a team in the starting lineup. I think their bench is good. Campaign could be really important for them, you know, creating tempo. You, you pair him up with Connaughton and with Portis, Portis, you know, he's going to be a rival for quickly for six and a half of the year, as is Chris Paul in Golden State. So the bench is, seems to be fine, but the starting lineup, you know, you could see anything, but they're coming off a bad game. Uh, and I, I think we'll make it a little bit tougher for the Knicks. Buck's still figuring some things out. Sean, who do you think needs to excel Friday night for the Knicks to walk out of there with a win? Uh, I think we're going to need a really big game from Jalen Brunson. I, I think he's just due for one. Um, and he's going to have to put that pressure on. They probably won't put Damian Lillard on him, but he's going to have to match that production just from the guard position. And beyond that, I think that it's going to also be a big game for Mitchell Robinson or Isaiah Hardenstein, whoever takes a lion's share of the minutes. Uh, Mitch is uh, amazing. He's been amazing all season. He's an excellent defender. Honestly, I think he should be in a defensive player of the year conversation. I'm going to try to push that agenda all year. But if he has one struggle, it's with four spacing bigs. And so Brooke Lopez is going to be spacing the floor. Uh, he's going to be, you know, out on the three-point line. They're, they're going to have an open paint. And so Mitchell Robinson is going to have to figure out how he's going to be able to provide the help 
on the pick and roll between Dame and Giannis and also be able to stay home for Brooke Lopez and close out and stay on his feet, but he keep high hands. So I think it's going to be a lot of, it's going to be a big challenge for him. And if we're able to contain that and not allow that to affect us to the tune of, you know, 30 Porzingis points, like we saw in the opener, I think that'll do a lot for us defensively, which should help us win the game. So we got GHD, we got Mitchell Robinson, we got Jalen Brunson, plenty to look out for Friday night. And again, we are very excited to tell you that we are now available on podcast form, uh, the putback on podcast form. So be sure to download that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you miss us on the screen, you can hear us on the audio. So we're very excited about that. And we'll be back with you guys next Thursday at noon. I want to give a big thank you to Sean Geddes from the Knicks Bowl, Brendan Brown. I mean, if you heard him, you heard the three decades of NBA experience come out as analysis. We really appreciate your time, Brendan. And we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Uh, it's great to be on with everybody. And then Sean and I, we come a little different.